morning and welcome to worship here with the people of St. John United Church of Christ in Robinson, Texas. We're so glad that you've joined us here on Memorial Day weekend. This Memorial Day, of course, looks a little different than the others, but we're glad that you have come to worship with us today. We start every worship service here by reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are, you are always welcome here. So no matter what part of the world you are watching this video on this morning, I'm glad that you've come to worship with us. Just one announcement before we get started today. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. It'll be a little bit of a bigger deal, so I will be in the church sanctuary filming that. Uh, we will also be celebrating communion for Pentecost Sunday. And so if you want to go ahead and get on your grocery list for next week to have some bread and grape juice or wine so that you can celebrate communion with us this Pentecost Sunday. With all that being said, we're going to go, and go ahead and have a moment of silence as I light the candle. Then we'll have a scripture reading, a brief sermon, a prayer, a hymn, and a benediction. Come, let us worship the risen Lord together. Well, today's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. This, of course, is Christ's high priestly prayer. We have several of Jesus' prayers preserved, the most famous being the Lord's Prayer. But this is a much longer prayer of Jesus's from right before he is to be crucified. You will find this a familiar passage, especially the final verse. Hear now what the Spirit is still speaking to God's church, John 17, 1 through 11. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence, before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy God, protect them in your name that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Sisters and brothers, these words are true and can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Well, as we consider this text this morning, I want to begin with a simple question. Why would Jesus pray? Remember that Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God incarnated among us. So why then would God the Son need to pray to God the Creator, God the Parent, God the Father? Why would Jesus Christ need to pray? 
Perhaps this is getting at a deeper question. Why do you pray? For what reason do you find yourself continuing to sit down, fold your hands, close your eyes, and pray? When we pray, does God hear and respond in a way that means something? Does God change God's will because we have asked? If we ask God for something, does that influence if it happens or not? Siblings in Christ, this is a very important question. Christianity is unique in that it claims that we have relationship with our God. But in that relationship, does God listen to and answer prayer? Well, friends in Christ, no matter how you feel about the issue, in this scripture we see that Jesus, at least, believes that God listens and God answers. Family of God, this is why I am convinced that God still listens, God still hears, God still responds, and God still speaks today. Because if, if even Jesus needed to approach God with requests and prayer, how much more so do we need to do so? Like I mentioned at first, this is a much longer prayer than the Lord's Prayer. We're used to praying Jesus' words every week here at St. John, but it's almost poetic and very short, easy to memorize, the kind of thing that we teach to our kids before they're very old. It's not that hard. But this prayer from Jesus is a little different. We only read 11 verses, but this prayer continues on for the remainder of the chapter. And as Jesus prays, he goes from this kind of confidence that he begins the prayer with to being much more vulnerable and requesting from God the things that he does not know if they will happen. You see, Jesus approaches prayer in much the same way we should be approaching prayer. And though sometimes Jesus gives short, beautiful, scripted prayers, in this instance, we see Jesus praying in sort of a stream of consciousness, stream of thought kind of way. We see Jesus not only praying to God in very formal, scripted settings, but we also see Jesus here in this deep and intimate moment just praying his heart out to God. He prays about many things. It begins with a discussion of his own glorification. But then his prayer moves to something amazing. He begins to ask of God protection for his disciples. You see, Jesus not only prays the truth he knows to be true, he prays a request that he hopes will come true in the future. Just as we pray, St. John, not just for the things we know will happen, but we also bring our requests and our praises before God as well. When we come before God in prayer, we know full well that not every prayer gets answered the way we would like for it to. Not every scenario has the outcome we would hope for or we would pray for. But we trust that when we pray to God, God listens and God responds even when it is not the response we want, God answers and God hears. Even when God's answer is silence, we believe that God has heard. What I find most amazing in this prayer, though, is not just that Jesus is praying about himself, on this, the very day that he would be crucified, 
but that Jesus begins to look outside of himself and to pray for the world and the disciples. How often in our prayer lives do we get so caught up in ourselves or in our own wants and needs? How often do we get so self-absorbed in our spiritual life that we forget that the entire goal of a spiritual life is to go out into the world and pray for others? Christ gives us an example here to not just bring our prayer requests before God, but to bring our whole selves and our whole community before the Lord as well. To not just pray for ourselves, but to pray for others. What then does Jesus pray for others? Well, this is what you might remember the most in this passage. Since 1957, the United Church of Christ has had a theme verse, a theme scripture, so to speak. And it's this one. Let me read it for you one more time. And now I am no longer in the world, but they, meaning the disciples, are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy God, protect them, the disciples, and your name that you have given me, so that they may all be one as we are one. It was a bold choice our spiritual forefathers took to join a new denomination together out of these seemingly at one time incompatible Christian groups. One group had a beautiful worshiping tradition even in the German language, and the other group was more based in New England as the Congregationalists that we read of in the founding of America. But in 1957, they had the courage to come together, though they seemed quite different, they had the courage to come together as a united church under this scripture with Jesus praying that they may all be one the way he and God are one. Brothers and sisters, this should be a solemn call for us to remember our unity. That we need to be just as united as a church as the God of the Trinity is united in community. Just as closely as God the Father and God the Son, just as closely as God the Son and God the Spirit, just as closely as God the Spirit and God the Father are connected, we too need to be connected to one another. Jesus prays that we may all be one as God is one. We are living in deeply divided days. We are perhaps more divided now than we have been since the Civil War, or perhaps the Civil Rights Movement. The nation is reeling in this division. Brothers and sisters, when is the last time that you have considered that it is our church's calling to be an example of unity in these days of division. This means that though I know for a fact there are those in our church who voted for different people this last election, that we can still come together and after coronavirus is through, have a potluck and sit at the same table together. This means that though some of us grew up speaking a different language or in a different place, though some of us grew up with completely different understandings of who God is, this means that the church is our meeting place for unity and community that we can represent out into the world around us. This is not only a calling for us, it is indeed even a creed. And I mean that as seriously as it sounds. We remember that Paul echoes much of Jesus' language 
about our unity, about our oneness, later on in the letter to the Galatians, when he says that there is now no longer Greek or free, uh, Greek or Jew, slave or free, male or female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. Many scholars believe that Paul was not writing these letters on his own, but that those words were coming from perhaps the very first Christian creed, that we may all be one in Christ Jesus, no matter how the world tries to divide us. This is our core belief, St. John, that we are united and uniting with one another. And so as we look out to this divided world in which we live, how can we be an example of Christian unity? This does not mean that all of the Christians in Robinson have to get together in one room and worship the same way in the same language with the exact same theology. What it does mean is that we join hand in hand with people of goodwill from across the faith traditions that we may truly represent Jesus to a broken and dying world. In a world that is concerned with who can get and keep the most power, we instead are concerned with restoring what was broken, healing the sick, raising the dead, providing good news for the poor. We may not agree on much theologically with other churches who, with, in whom we come into contact with, but we can agree on this. God's world is deeply broken, and it is, at least in part, our job to help fix that broken world, to live into God's dreams for God's earth together, to resurrect what was dead and to heal what was broken among us. Sisters and brothers, there are many denominations out there, and that's okay. Perhaps they understand part of the gospel we don't. Perhaps we understand something they don't. But at the end of the day, let us not allow our divisions to keep us apart from the things which are most important. Let us not erase our differences, let us celebrate our uniqueness in our differences, but at the end of the day, let's come together to do God's good work on this earth, even here and even now in the midst of coronavirus. I want to close today with an invitation. In the children's sermon earlier this weekend, I invited the kids to take a piece of paper and some crowns and to draw out their prayer to God. As we consider Christ's prayer for us here in these words, I would ask you to spend just a moment sitting and breathing and praying and asking God how you can display Christian unity in a world that is so deeply broken. I promise with you that I will be spending lots of time this week considering that question too. Perhaps when we come to next week, we can all come together, celebrate the Holy Spirit of the living God, and celebrate that God has truly called us to be one, even in divided and divisive times. God bless you, St. John United Church of Christ. May we be united and united evermore. Amen. And so here we find ourselves, friends, processing Christ's high priestly prayer, seeking to understand a Jesus who is bold enough to ask God for what he wants, who prays that God's will be done, who knows that if God's will will be done, perhaps our will must be undone. 
So as we process Christ's prayer, we will take this opportunity to pray ourselves. We'll start with just a moment of silence. I will voice a prayer for all of us, and then we will end by reciting our beloved Lord's Prayer. So let's take just a moment to calm ourselves, to center our souls, and to pray to God for whatever is on our mind this day. God of all history, God of today and God of tomorrow, God who teaches us how to pray, we come before you this morning in humility, in vulnerability to pray for our world, for our church, and ourselves. We lift up our world to you this morning, O oh God, chaotic as it is, unsure as it is. We pray for our leaders, that they may have wisdom and patience in how they lead. We pray for our hospitals and medical workers, for our restaurants and grocery stores. We pray for all those who have lost a job in this pandemic, or those who are afraid that they still may lose one. We lift up all those who are sick for the fear that they must feel and for their concerned family members. We pray, Lord, that your presence will be with them, that you will comfort them, and that they will know the joy of your resurrection. We pray for our church, O oh God, even as we are separated, make us one in Christ Jesus. Strengthen our witness to this world. Strengthen our resolve to listen and understand. Strengthen our voices to, to speak for justice and work that your will may be done. We pray for our church members who are sick and for those who take care of them. May your healing hand be present with them. Finally, God, we lift ourselves up to you, each with our own prayer requests and needs. Fill them, O God, in a way that only you can. Open our ears to hear, for we know that you are still speaking. And now we are bold to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, St. John, it is always a joy to pray with you. Before we transition to our hymn, I did want to remind you uh, that this is when we would normally be taking up our offering. And so if you have not done so lately and you uh, would normally give in a Sunday service at St. John, please do mail your check to the church office at 100 South Robinson Drive in Robinson, Texas, zip code 76706. I'd like to thank all of you who have continued generously giving in this time of crisis. Um, it is because of your generosity that we can continue to minister even in these strange and uncertain days. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your generosity. Well, as we bring our service to a close this morning, I want to sing that great old hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. It should be very easy to find the lyrics online. This is a great hymn with the words taken from St. Francis of Assisi. Let us sing and praise the Lord together.
Amen. St. John, it is always a joy to worship alongside you, to worship with you. I pray that you and your family, even in this odd time, have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. And I can't wait to celebrate Pentecost with you next week. Hear now the benediction. This week, St. John, may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. Oh, and may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.